so you know, we I, going into this, we're both you know yogurt enthusiasts. But I think even more than your passion for yogurt, I, you know, I'm most interested kind of in this word that we were talking about earlier, which is you know entrepreneurship. So you know. Hamdi, here's a guy who comes from a family of nomads in Turkey. They raised and herded uh, sheep. They made yogurt and cheese and then sold that yogurt to market. He was the first of his family members to go to college. I feel like you weren't necessarily sort of being groomed to be a CEO in a traditional sense, but in other ways, maybe you were. Where do you, like, what was your childhood like? And, do you think there are values of entrepreneurship that were instilled in you in an early age? Sure. Um, first of all, I'm really honored to be next to you and being here with you all. Um, I knew Anthony. I never knew he does cool shit like this. I mean, <laughs> um, and Will. I just met Will. This is this is really really amazing. Um, I think survival is entrepreneurship. You know, when mm -hmm. you are up in the mountains and you're a nomad and, you know, you find solutions every day. You know, where do you go? And your mother makes decisions, your shepherd makes decisions, your father makes decisions, you make decisions. Um, I think one of the biggest responsibility you're given as you're a nomad, and at least a Kurdish nomad, up in the mountains is, you know, you have 100 sheep or 200, whatever it is, that's your wealth, that's yeah. your belongings, everything, yeah. you know, your whole family depend on that animals. And if, if father or mother says, you gotta take care of them for the next seven, eight hours. Yeah. And they could go, you know, you could lose them, wolf can attack them, a lot of stuff can happen. So in a young age, six, seven, 10, 11, when you are given that kind of trust, you make decisions. You mm -hmm. start taking care of them. Mm -hmm. You care. I think those things are entrepreneurship, you know, in training, I, I would say. You when, know, you've been trained being a decision maker or, 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 or whatever. Now running a company like Chobani, like what are some of the things from, you know, the, the sheep herding days that you think yeah. that you apply to sort of the everyday at the business? I think this whole thing comes from life. Like uh, uh, somebody asked me the other day, I never thought that I would be involved in business in this sense. I never thought yeah. when, before I arrived here. I really didn't like rich people. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there's any here, but no. I think, I, I, think, I think there are a lot of rich people in here, um, actually. <laughs> because from the mountains where we were, it didn't look nice. You know, it didn't look nice when I went to school. It didn't look nice you know, how they position themselves or how the businesses and, you know, CEOs and people look so distant as if they are chosen ones, as if they're some God hands and touched in them something. We ordinary people, we were happy. I mean, we had enough. We did not have a lot, but, you know, we had the stars. We had the, you know, each other. We had that kind of security that if something happens in, to any of us, the many will come uh, to help. Um, when I arrived to upstate New York, um, my thoughts on entrepreneurship and business, you know, kind of changed. It was a different picture that I saw there that I was used to when I was growing up in Turkey. Um, and when I started Chobani later on, I'd never been to a business school. I never read a business book. Yeah. I never worked anywhere. I never had friends who had done this before. You had started your own newspaper, though. I started a newspaper in, when I was in college. <laughs> he started a newspaper for yeah. his hometown in college. And that's why I got in trouble, and, and the government went after me, so I had to get out. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. I thank the Turkish government, so I'm here now. You know. Uh, but one thing that's interesting, you hate rich people, but now you objectively are a rich person. How do you... I don't hate anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to hate when you don't have anything. <laughs> How do you prevent yourself from becoming like one of the rich people, like the, rich, the qualities you hated in the ri those rich people? Um, my fight was, how do I not become... As someone I growing up hating, 
Mm -hmm. I don't know if I said it perfectly in English. So my conditions was, if I go to home every day and sleep, wake up in the morning, it says, did I become the person I grew up hating? Mm -hmm. That was my, um, my line. Um, being upstate, starting with four factory workers in that tiny little community, mm -hmm. and interacting with farmers, interacting with the local community there, the world was so far away. Yeah. And our odds of success was so small. Our resources were nothing. We had nothing. Like, we had nothing. And, and when we start painting those walls in 2007, I had this feeling that everything we needed, I have it. Mm -hmm. And I just have to figure out how to start and how to get there. Right. So then my painful time started. And you know, for seven years, I was in the factory. I never left the factory. And when I came out of that place, and they said that you've done something, or you guys have done something that never been done before, all those rules and, or, or, or reasons for successes came from the nomadic lifestyle that I was growing up. Yeah. One. Two, came from the people who were lived and worked in that factory in South Edmiston, New York, or the farmers that I interacted with that has been around for generations and generations. So, you know, these typical rules of business or CEO has been written somewhere out there, yep. but it's not really aligned with the human, you know, nature. I mean, one thing I want to talk to you about, about that specifically is um, one thing that I think you focus on that not all companies do that I think is kind of critical to your success is diversity in the workplace. And obviously this is something a lot of people talk about but don't actually do. But when you look around in your workplace, you can see a tangible diversity, people of different ethnicities, genders, backgrounds. You know, me as a journalist, you know, I am constantly frustrated by the lack of diversity in mastheads and food publications. To me, it feels obvious why there should be diversity in food magazines. It means that there's multiple perspectives. There's different normals. The normal isn't roast chicken and spaghetti as like the standard of home cooking. And I'm curious, in a product setting, why is that diversity and that sort of intersectionality of that diversity important? Like how tangibly has it helped your business? Well, when I arrived to that old factory in South Edmiston, I was the only dark person. Yeah. So I was the only one who spoke English a little bit. Mm -hmm. So my, until I met Frank, who was the uh, pizzeria in town. He's <laughs> from Sicily. He's been here for 30 years. He speaks English worse than me. <laughs> <laughs> and that was him. It was him and I, right? So we started the first person the, after four, the, the fifth person we hired came up, Maria hired her, and she said, this is Fabiana. I said, hi, Fabiana. And she had an accent. I said, where are you from? And she said, I'm from Brazil. Mm -hmm. So how did you make it up here from Brazil? So she married to someone, we made it up here. And when she answered the call, nobody would understand what she was saying. That was very heavy. She became head of purchasing, like you would hire four or five hundred million dollars ingredients for us you know, later on. Um, so, the work that I did on the diversity, I never looked at it as a work on the diversity. Yeah. Right? I, I don't know how to look at it that way. Yeah. People show up, and whoever you are, and okay. <laughs> and, and then this, this level of judgment is not there. And we did a, we did a, other surveys we never did, but later on they did it like two years ago. One of the most critical thing at Chobani is I feel home. The line that everybody said, I feel home. And yet we have 19 different nationalities, 16 different languages spoken. 30% of our workforce are refugees and immigrants. Yeah. I mean, you, it's a United Nation everywhere, right? So our head of engineering is, uh, is French, our head of uh, R&D is German from Bavaria. Um, our CFO is Dutch. I mean, it's not diversity in the sense of 
you know, color and gender and all that kind of stuff. It's people from all over the place. Now, how did, how did this, cup, this, this whole thing happen? Um, you know, yogurt is magical, you know? You, <laughs> you get a lot of cultures in yogurt, the one. Second is... <laughs> I gotta do some advertising over here. <laughs> I have to tell you. How long have you been teeing up that joke? <laughs> <laughs> you let people truly be themselves. And that means you don't even try. And that means they just don't have to pretend. And the, one of the first things I've ever done when I started the, started the company is the word, I don't know. People would ask me questions, and I said, I don't know. Let's find out. And making OK, I don't know. And making OK that you don't have to look a certain way. You don't have to know a lot of stuff. Yeah. You don't have to act certain stuff. It's OK. And it really is OK. The minute that happens, I would say you save 70% of the time people pretending. Because if you are trying to be someone that you really not, but the people are expecting you to be, you start from home, start pretending. How do I sound smart? How do I ask the same question? How do I look good? How do I do this? How do... If you erase that, you save 70, 50 to 70% of the time. Then I am authentically me. I can be me. Then whatever the work I bring to the life yeah. is authentic, right? People, I mean, People in our place, um, and I'm going to plant, you know, this week, tomorrow, actually. And these are the two reddest areas of the country. It's Idaho, the reddest, I think, more conservative. I don't, I don't know if anything more conservative than Idaho. Yeah. And upstate New York is also the same way. Yeah, yep. And in these places, we have 30% of our workforce are people from 19 different nationalities. Yeah. And these are brothers and sisters, side by side, making yogurt, building life. And nobody's, you know, uh, judging anyone. I mean, how do you feel like that, that diversity, like, actively contributes to your business? Like, Massive. what? Massive. How and, and you know, in, in what ways does, what, what are some tangible ways that, that it has helped? Well, I, I think, um, first of all, having your place is representation of human life is extremely important. So you're not disconnected from, from humanity, really. Mm -hmm. um, second one is, you know, having different opinions, but yet finding out to live together in peace and work together and contribute to common goals. Yeah. These are simplest things, but is extremely massive in, in the life of company and life of family as well. Um, and then the ideas that coming from different, different people on how should we run factory, how we yep. should run the plant, how we should be behaving in certain ways, how we should be talking about certain things, how we should be innovating, how we should be going to court. These ideas coming from the diversity as well. If they were all Kurds or Turks like me, you know, God help you. But um, <laughs> But it's all different, different people. So if you look at the, you know, people say this all the time, you go to a garden, you see different type of flowers and plants. Yeah. And that's what makes it so beautiful. Um, but this was not a work, really. We did not have a diversity plan to yeah. make this happen. We just, the people will ask us and we look at it and say, wow, look at us. You know, I, I never thought that way. I mean, it's probably because like you yourself are a person of color. Exactly, exactly. Pro why there need to be more leaders who are people of color in business. 100%. I'm curious More when you women. go, yes, when you go to conferences or when you meet other CEOs, is it often like you're the only person of color in the room? Does that happen a lot when you go to other conferences, you go to other meetings? I don't know. I'm just envisioning like meetings of rich people in a room. I, don't know. <laughs> I, was, I was in a conference with a lot of billionaires there. Um, look, I, I think we are in a very critical time in the, when it comes to, you know, form of business. I grew up hating. I appreciate now and I value the power of business. I really do. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in the community in upstate New York. I've seen it happen in the, 
in the consumer's life and the people's life when they have an access to good food. I've seen and refugees' life when we start, you know, entering it. I, I'm not saying we're solving a lot of problems, but I yeah. see it. I see businesses so, is extremely powerful platform if it really acts in a certain way that cares, not just check the box and you know corporate social responsibility, look how nice I am. Um, but at the same time, the income inequality um, between working class and the rich has never been this big, mm -hmm. even in this country. Rich is getting a lot richer and poor is getting poorer. Uh, the new generation is coming up and saying, you know what, this is not a just world. Maybe we gotta do something about these rich people and the business people. The, the pay between CEOs and janitors is getting wider and wider. Mm -hmm. So what is gonna happen next is two things. One is businesses and CEOs are going to act according to society's needs and solve and be part of solving the, solving the issues. Or this, this gap is gonna get wider and wider and then this create hate and then there's going to be a movement against this, yeah. right? So then that movement can be in the voting or can be anything else. And that could be a, 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 a at really block on potentials of businesses solving problem, making innovations for, for humankind going forward. And that responsibility is in the hands of the investors, boardrooms, and CEOs. Because if you ask the employees and consumers, they're already there. Right. They're already there. So this anti-CEO movement needs to start and needs to start happening right now. And the, luckily, there's a lot of conversation happening with CEOs and businesses, what's the role of companies and businesses going forward in society. This conversation's happening really alive. And I see some, some signs, but it's not happening fast. Because the political landscape is failing. It's failing here, it's failing in Europe, it's failing in Turkey, it's failing a lot of places. And these gains that humanity made is going like five step forward, four step backward, and people are suffering because of it. And, and for that reason, I really don't see any other platform other than businesses and, and CEOs and companies to step up. Yeah, I find this interesting because you said that you gave a TED talk and you said that you disagree with the notion that businesses should stay out of politics. I feel like we're in a room full of hospitality people. I feel like the number one rule in hospitality is, you know, don't, don't get political. Don't, you know, stay neutral on Jose these things. Jose Andres is different, I mean, he's, <laughs> you know, he's out there. But I, you know, I, I, I think it's not the magnitude of the work and, and noise that you can make, it's the authenticity and real work that you can make is the most important thing. Um, in one restaurant and one shop, a truly meaning work that they, you know, they do is more powerful for me than a large company doing a CSR check you know, corporate responsibility check. It's not who makes it big, it's like every one of us start doing certain things. And I, I really appreciate the, especially the food movement and, and, and the restaurant and hospitality movement on ingredients, ingredients integrity. Mm -hmm. Ingredient integrity is very nice, you know, I have organic, I have natural, I have free of preservatives, it's coming from the farm, it's humane, it's this, it's that. Uh, that's fine but I have to bring up another dimension to ingredients that we use that, that, that you say that is the ingredients are humane. Because you can have the label says organic, but there's no one to check what's happening in that farm and in that farm what's happening to the workers. You don't know what's happening in that plant and what kind of, what kind of treatment is happening in that plant to the people. And those emotions are traveling with that food to a lot of places. Those emotions are traveling. And for this world to go to a better place, of course the ingredients need to be right. But the emotional ingredients, the humane ingredients of the work of that business is the one is going to make it possible for humanity going forward. So do you all do any sort of political advocacy to that effect to sort of make sure that you, know, you all are able to you know, get access to ingredients that are raised humanely, um, where, yeah, where does the politics sort of come from? Right, so if you're getting a tomatoes, the, 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 the workers are collecting the tomatoes, where do they sleep? 
mm -hmm. right? You can say my, organics are, my, my tomatoes are organic, but the people who are collecting those tomatoes, how much they get paid, how is their conditions, where do they sleep, what, how, how is that paid, right? You put on the scale which one is more important. They're both important. But getting an organic tomatoes does not mean that people who touch those, organic, those, those tomatoes are in a humane conditions. Right. These are simple ingredients that we are asking. I think we need to widen our ask, push everyone to go into the right direction. Because I tell you, not all the regulations of the, of the government or the state or the cities or the politicians are taking care of everyone. There are a lot of people are left behind. I mean, I think one thing that's sort of important to maybe take a step back is, you know, you run this amazing social enterprise. You know, the anti-CEO playbook is all about caring for the employees, the environment, where your ingredients are coming from. How do you balance that with, you know, the need to meet your bottom line? Obviously, spreadsheets are not sexy, but they need, exactly. they need to happen. Like, you need to meet your numbers. How, how do you achieve that balance? And that's the key. And but by not knowing, not learning from schools or, or from the books, I'd realize that if you truly mean it, that you are for, the, for your employees, for your community, and you answer the consumers, and, and you do right by your environment, that does not go against fundamentals of the business that makes you even more innovative, mm -hmm. more profitable, faster than anyone, you have all employees of one. You have all communities behind you. Nobody can stop you. So these are not against each other. When you're doing this, the it's not like will come. profit yeah. totally comes. Hmm. One, one um, condition. This is not a side work. This is every day is your work. Yeah. This is not a foundation work. This is not a check the box work. This is what it is every day. This is the roadmap or, or playbook of every day's act. So that comes to the managers or to CEOs, yeah. to the owners, the owners to the leaders. And that's the one that sets the tone, and that's how it goes. And that's called culture. Yeah. And without culture, you go nowhere. There's no yogurt. It just goes back <laughs> to culture. <laughs> I have one last question that's kind of a, like a fun question. The cut, this, the New York Magazine fashion section is this, uh, has this section uh, where they interview uh, successful people on sort of how they get it done, how they manage their day, what their morning routine is like. I'm wondering if you have any a specific like morning routine or an exercise or something no. that you do that is kind of different that sort of helps ground you or sort of keeps you moving forward, whether it's a method or I, I don't know. Is there is there something that comes to yeah. mind? Yeah, I feel like those people are answering those questions. They just trying to look nice. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I just quit smoking a year ago, um, this January, I think. Um, so I ate the worst things. I slept very little all those times. Um, didn't exercise a lot. Um, didn't meditate either. Um, <laughs> You don't so, keep a dream journal? <laughs> no, I don't keep journals. Um, I'm, I'm starting to listen to some of those things. I, I see a lot of benefits to it. There was, a lot of, there was one teaching that they said, you need to turn your phone off, um, just disconnect. And I said, that's just not possible. Yeah. Uh, it's just not possible. How am I going to disconnect? I think one of the most important things in this journey mm -hmm. is having a support. Mm -hmm. Having someone next to you or around you that really cares who you are, not what you become or what you're making or how you're seen out there. And these are called family or friends or partner or whoever that person is. Um, and I was lucky that I was having, you know, people around me that could, could tell me. And one day, I, in the second year of the journey, I think this was second or third, I brought everybody at Chobani into this conference room, and I said to them, this journey we just started, it looks like it's gonna go to a really, really interesting place. I can see it, this is gonna get some big if we continue. But I'm worried, I said. I'm worried because I've never done this before. Um, I've never had that kind of access to money. I've never had this kind of successful things, and I've never had this much noise. I'm worried how I'm going to take this. 
I could become someone that, that, that you know, I might not like 10 years from now. Because I'm worried, I am giving every single one of you a permission <laughs> that if you see me act different than what I want now or year two years before, I'm giving every single one of you permission to hit me on the face. <laughs> It's a true story. And it's, this is in upstate New York. And these guys are big, huh? <laughs> and they look at me and says, are you serious? I said, yes. The only obstacle in our road going forward I see is me or us that we're changing our way based on the success that we, you know, so-called success comes out. And it's hard. It's hard on entrepreneurs. It's hard on businesses. It's hard on people. And how do you keep that going is going to be people around you, and that's the most important things. And they will tell you, eat good and sleep good too. Yeah. And you know, that's what they're for. And I'll give you one, and I don't know if I, did, I said it many times, and this is not the purpose that I did. For seven years, I kept something that belonged to my mother under my head. Mm. And I've never said to anyone. So every day I went to work, my mother passed a long time ago, and I am, by the way, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Every day is a Mother's Day. Um, <laughs> I've never said to anyone until we gave shares to our all employees. And I said, you guys think that I'm the one who did this. And I'll tell you what. And I took my head off. And it's still here. It's always here. Oh, wow. And I said, this is the last fabric my mother had before she passed away. Mm -hmm. And I kept that under my, my, my head. And I said, if I do wrong, she won't let me. <laughs> and and I said, all the credits you think is for me, it's not. It's for her. She is the one who taught me and who made sure that I try to do my best with you, with what I do every day and everything else. So I was lucky to have not only people around me, but my teacher, like my mother or my parents, mm -hmm. that I valued her, 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 who she was, that extremely effective, even in the field of business she had nothing to do with. So mm -hmm. with that, I think... Um, in any journey that anyone I do, and I have, I have, today is the first day of Turkish incubator class, which we brought 35 entrepreneurs from Turkey to here uh, uh, with NYU. They're going to go back. And I told them what it is. Just be yourself. Just be you. Don't try to be anybody. Don't let anybody think that you're less. Just you're enough. Just learn. Keep your wide open. Otherwise, how is this nomad from the mountain of Kurdish sits the coolest girl in, in, in the food writing and, and speaking to the most amazing people in this room. It's just enjoy the journey. That's well, all. Thank you so much, Hamdi. Thank you.